This has been an extraordinary year to be a trade minister. So you've had uh, three free trade agreements and one trans-Pacific partnership. Mm. Which was the toughest to negotiate? Well, they're all their own little unique beast, if you like. Uh, everyone has to be uh, a different strategy and the different sensitivities. But I, I do perhaps think that the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, with 12 countries, um, all trying to end up on the same same level playing field, that was quite difficult, especially in the end with the Americans over some issues. And, uh, you know, it took a lot of um, self-control, if you like, to maintain positions. And uh, But we ended up where we, where we wanted to, so that worked out well. Mm. In those kind of negotiations, do you, as the Minister, lead? Or do you have people, your team, will lead and then come to you with the final agreement? How involved are you as the Minister in those? Uh, well, uh, quite involved. But I mean, there's literally thousands of decisions yeah. uh, with these agreements. And I have a very professional team. And some of them are, are really highly technical issues um, about the rules that might apply to, in, you know, um, intellectual property or um, the rules that might apply to customs arrangements between countries and all the rest. Now, a lot of that is negotiated um, by a, a team, quite a big team of, of officials, you know, 20 or more people, and we draw people from different departments as well uh, so that we've got that expertise. But uh, I do set the strategy um, in the first instance about... Um, you know, what the broad mandate is, I take that to Cabinet um, and that sort of sets the strategy. But also as we go along, um, I can see, I get to see, you know, what's going to work with, on the big issues, on the big issues, what will work with the, those we're negotiating with. Um, and then when we get to the difficult issues, political issues that need a political decision, uh, then I've got carriage of that as well, again with the support, great support. But uh, so I have, I have a lot of involvement on the way through, but uh, many of the sort of detail issues, the team, they fight that out at, at their level. Mm. Does it get down to you and another minister or, or a couple of ministers in a room over a beer? <laughs> well, yes it does in a way, but not necessarily a beer, um, like the, the Japanese deal, we were to conclude it when the two leaders came together in Tokyo at a certain date 18 months ago and we had 13 hours negotiation the day before uh, but to conclude it, two ministers, the two of us, when we had some of our advisors with us but basically we were negotiating and we'd, we'd negotiate for an hour break for 20 minutes, you know, and then come back and that went on for 13 hours. With the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, on the issue of biologics, which was intellectual property for pharmaceuticals, um, Mike Frame and, and I really negotiated for two and a half, hour, two and a half days, I'm sorry, towards in Atlanta at the end. All the other negotiations between all the other 10 parties stopped because they saw if we didn't get to a conclusion on that issue, the whole deal wouldn't have been completed in Atlanta as it was ultimately. But um, I had seven hours sleep and I met him ten times at all hours of the day and night for two and a half days. Just exhausting. Well it was, but uh, it's the way it works. <laughs> it's the way it goes. Uh, everyone was there to try and conclude and uh, well both of us were digging in. so. Um, you know, we had to proceed that way and there's everyone else and all their parties, I mean there are literally hundreds of people uh, there waiting to con get to their concluding issues. But they weren't going to put those on the table until we had resolved that. So, yeah, it's not all beer and Skittles and we didn't have much beer, Mike Freeman and I. We were <laughs> it was, um, no, it gets pretty tense, yeah. There was a lot of criticism about the TPP, about it, it not being transparent, and there mm. have been calls for 
these trade negotiations to be much more transparent. Now, is that realistic? Um, no, it's not. Um, I mean, it's really, to be honest, the, the major people out there making those claims now for, for years are the same people who I noticed from you know, 20 years ago were opposing any trade agreement. And this is the latest sort of vehicle for creating concern in the broader community. The fact is, firstly, that we have literally thousands of meetings with stakeholders um, and they they know their own patch what's happening. And, and how else could we do it anyway? We, we don't know when the, when another country offers to do something in the dairy sector, you know, or the um, you know cabinet making or forestry or you know whatever sector. It's it's the whole economy we're dealing with. We don't know what impact that would have on the ground. So we have to get them in and say. They've offered this, you know, what do, what do you suggest? Now, we then make a decision based on what they say. We've got to balance a whole lot of requirements. But they know, and then we say in the end where we moved, not in the end, well, as we move along, where we got to. So uh, there is not secrecy. Uh, we haven't put it on the table because it's just like the conversation we have is like you'd have with your real estate agent who's negotiating for you. You don't tell the vendor what your limit is, you know. And that's exactly what all these people are asking us to do, to go and tell where the country's limit is on everything so that all of our opponents like playing poker with your cards on the table. It's just ridiculous. You're now moving towards uh, an FTA with India. Yes. How are those negotiations going and how difficult is that going to be? Well, they've got a reputation for um, being very difficult to negotiate with and they have got very significant levels of protection. Uh, we've had, I'm just to, to head off on Sunday for my, I think it's my sixth or seventh visit this year. Um, the new government, at a government at a political level, the Prime Minister in particular, is very much committed, from what I can see, to open up the country, to liberalise. Um, a lot of the bureaucracy is been for decades um, pushing a different agenda. Um, so the year's been an interesting one in terms of the interplay within India of these forces for liberalisation and, and others who are not comfortable with it. So we haven't got there yet, there's still a bit of work to do, um, but I, you know, I'm very confident if with the Prime Minister Modi maintaining the pressure that um, that we, we will get there, but it's, it's, it is very hard yards, I've got to say, and a lot of it's the politics within India as much as um, the negotiation that, that we're having. Not much you can do about that. Well, um, no, well, I can keep informing the politicians about my perception of what's happening you know, um, within the bureaucracy. Um, they're probably well aware of it, but um, we did set dar targets and things, which and the Prime Minister Modi actually was very keen to set it. So those disciplines can be very helpful with the Chinese deal. Uh, if we didn't have, if we hadn't had set a target with President Xi and Prime Minister Abbott, um, we'd probably still be negotiating. I mean, these things, once the leaders say that's it well then it becomes a source of potential huge embarrassment if, if it's not achieved. So the leaders don't do that lightly, set target dates, but uh, I've found it very useful. It's helped me maintain a lot of momentum in nearly all the agreements for that matter, except TPP. So is there a template for free trade agreements now? Uh, well, no, they are different because, uh, I mean, when we, when we have a, an agreement with a developed country, uh, in many cases developed countries already have quite free access to services, education, health services, engineering services, architectural services, all the things um, that are part of the <coughs> broadly the services co economy. And uh, bear in mind, 75% of our own GDP is now made up of services, um, not goods. So do you see the services as Australia's main um, trade advantage now? 
I most certainly do. I think in the decades ahead, what we've got to offer all of these emerging economies that now are on our doorstep, all the way from India to China and everything in between, in the end they have to become service-based economies because that's where the jobs are. That's where the big jobs are. And they've still got hundreds of millions of people across that whole region who are moving out of rural areas into the cities, hundreds of millions. So um, we've got world-class services. We can help train the trainers, if you like. We can't go in there. We're not big enough to, you know, to, uh, to provide all the services for those companies. But we can, you know, we've got 80 architectural firms now in China and 1,000 architects. And they don't touch the sides, <laughs> mm. right? but they are doing their reputation is huge. Our stand, our services standards are gold standard in the region. They think we're just world class, which we are. I don't think Australians realise just how we're perceived, how positively we're perceived. And the next big step will be for even small and medium businesses to establish a position in some of these economies, uh, probably with a joint venture. And that way, they take their, our expertise out of Australia and put it together with the scale and the reach of companies within all these regions. Um, and that way, we can, we can take advantage of our expertise, but at the same time, help all these economies reach, reach the potential, the huge potential that they've got. It's quite exciting. Does the rise and rise of the FTAs, and we're not the only country that are doing free trade agreements, mm. mean the death of any hopes for global trade reform? Well, it, it is leading to global trade reform in my view. To me it's, you know, the trouble with the trouble that it has existed with the WTO, which is the multilateral, all the 160 countries, is that there are 160 countries. So you get countries like Bolivia and Cuba who, who've got the right to veto any agreement. So it's full of a lot of developing countries and a lot of developed countries. And you never get to an end point because everyone, too many disagreements and it has to be consensus. So that's 20 years, virtually no results yet. Right? But in the meantime, there are 350 of these bilateral or regional agreements that are in place. There's another 100 currently being negotiated. And I see them like bricks in a wall. Right? Every agreement starts to break down protection within each country. Now it might be tiny steps rather than you know, a great big one. The great big one's too hard, that's what's working out. You've got to take it incrementally and you can move quickly. I mean, we've done four agreements in two and a half years. I mean, um, these things can be progressed if there's a political will there. Uh, but, um, and all of the countries, for instance, in the TPP, nearly all of them had free trade agreements with one another, bilateral agreements. And they all saw there was an advantage to go take the, those agreements to another level and, and agree to one set of rules rather than a sort of noodle bowl of, of rules underneath. And so, but it made it easier. The fact that we'd all done deals pretty much with one another, not all but most, um, it, it, it meant that we had broken through on lots of areas already. It was much easier then to come to one set of arrangements. Now that, that TPP, which is sort of half the Asia Pacific, we do a similar agreement with the other half and then bring the two together and you're heading towards a multilateral agreement. It's like a jigsaw. It is, it is. But it's, like I say, I think each agreement's like another brick in the wall. And when you've built the wall, you've got a multilateral agreement. Minister, thank you very much for joining the AIIA. It's been a great pleasure. Have a Thanks, Nora. Have a great Nora. break. <laughs> okay, good on you.